Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know all of you have flown over from uh, elsewhere. So welcome to Hong Kong. It's not usually this rainy. Um, and I know we've got about half an hour and three panelists, so I'm just going to jump into it because we're everything between, we're everything standing between the audience and lunch. Um, I think the first question on my end is, you know, China has been a, a real engine of growth for ultras. Um, you know, this is a key target market for private banks. And, um, you know, it's been a bit slower these days with the IPO engine sort of slowing down, with growth slowing down. So what are the key engines of growth for the new ultras? Uh, Rajesh, if you could start. Sure. Um, thank you uh, for, the, for, the, for calling us. It's, it's a great panel. It's been a great session so far. Uh, indeed, China has been huge. It's been massive. Uh, for most wealth managers, it's the single largest market. Uh, and I dare say it will continue to be the single largest uh, market. The size is just absolutely huge. You have two and a half million dollar millionaires. You have 55,000 ultra high net worth clients. It's a factor of two to five compared to the next and the one after that. So it's absolutely huge for us. And I think for the rest of the industry, it will continue to be huge as well. Um, growth has slightly slowed down, but it doesn't mean the industry is not growing. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, in terms of uh, where the growth we see is Japan and India. Uh, India, you've seen three years of excellent growth. And when you think about how ultra high net worth wealth is created, IPOs is one. Uh, growth in earnings and dividend payouts is the other. And third, growth in asset valuation, typically equities and real estate is the third one. So in terms of percentage growth, I would say India and Japan way above. But in terms of just absolute magnitude, still a few years to catch up to China. Okay, so it's still India and Japan. Um, Pierre, I know you're based in Japan. Um, so I wondered what your opinion was. I think similar to what Rajesh said, uh, beyond looking at India and China in terms of the, the size of the markets, I think Japan at the moment is really growing. Um, the local markets have been very successful, both on the liquid side and the illiquid side. Mm -hmm. uh, that's created quite a lot of uh, demand for IPOs and uh, businesses being bought by private equity or larger businesses. Um, I think all that wealth created is definitely leading the, the third largest ultra-high market to grow. So we also see a lot of growth uh, onshore on the, the Japan side. Um, and we see a lot of demand from those families for international wealth management services. So beyond just looking at domestic wealth management services. Um, obviously, we've been onshore for four decades, so quite a long time. Um, and we think Japan is a very interesting market. Uh, we signed an alliance with the Mizuho Group uh, to tap their onshore know-how um, and mix it up with our international um, expertise. Um, and we think that will be a very good source of growth for us in the region. And uh, Ali, I just wondered what your view is. Uh, you know, you're obviously traveling a lot. You're not based in one, well, you're based in one place, but you're traveling all the time. Uh, so wh where do you see the biggest growth right now? I think the emerging market across Latin America is growing so fast with the ultra high net worth. Asia has been the discussion of everybody. Everybody liked the China story, the Hong Kong story, Singapore becoming a big winner. India, you cannot discount it. And I also what's happening in the Middle East, creating more opportunity for newcomers. There is stability in the region from political point of view. There is a new world has been creating, leading by Saudi Arabia with all the revolution what we see in Saudi Arabia domestically. There is a lot of wealth will be created. We see more Latin America, India, and Asia has been always there. And I think the Middle East is a new hub, a new market to be focused at. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely a lot of Middle East, um, you know, it's a growing region, a lot of attention on Middle East. And, and talking about Middle East, I just wanted to talk a bit about geopolitics in general. You know, it's, you know, clearly we've seen a lot of China, U.S. tensions, uh, positions have hardened this year as an elections year in uh, the U.S. Um, you know, geopolitics always sort of ranks quite high among concerns, among ultra wealthy. So, Pierre, you, you come from, a, you know, the founding family, Lombard family. I wanted to get a sense from you on what sort of concerns ultras have around geopolitics and also how they're sort of managing that risk. Uh, thank you for the question, Denise. I think it's one of the most uh, hot topics of the moment. Uh, geopolitics are definitely a big concern for, for ultras, uh, not just in Asia, but across the world. I think the, the conflict in Europe, the conflict in the Middle East, and the superpower tensions are definitely leading to clients being concerned. Um, that concern is leading clients to look for the safest and strongest financial centers, but also the safest and strongest financial institutions. Um, as you just mentioned, we've been um, doing wealth management for uh, eight generations as a, as a, as a business. 
um, this experience uh, is obviously something, and this stability and this continuity is obviously something that clients are increasingly looking for at the moment. Um, and this is obviously a call that we are answering. So where do you see the safest, you mentioned that you want to go to the safest financial centers, safest banks, you know, where, where do you see that? Uh, at the moment, we're seeing from Asia the most demand from Switzerland, for Switzerland, uh, Singapore, um, and as Ali was mentioning, to, to the UAE. Okay, so those are the regions that people, like the ultras, feel are safest. As, as offshore financial centers, yeah. Okay, and uh, in terms of banks, do you have a view on the safest banks? I think people are looking for the, the banks that are not listed, uh, especially after the, the recent tensions in the banking market. They're looking for unlisted uh, banks. They're looking for very high capital ratios, uh, the highest credit, credit ratings. And uh, in some cases, they're looking for pure play, uh, players to diversify their pool of banks. Okay. And Ali, I just wondered what's your view in terms of, you know, how you obviously talk to ultras all the time, yeah. you know. So what, what is, how are they sort of hedging themselves? Look, they look at it differently, like volatility create opportunity. The regional and the Middle East have the stability which is attract more money to it. We see the boom in Dubai, we see the boom in Abu Dhabi from family office, either it's an American, it's an Asian, it's an RI, it's even European family moving down there. I think the lack of vision Europe having today where the Middle East focus, look, we want to grow the business. This is the priority for us. We don't want to take a side of any war, anything in the world. We have a domestic priority. We want to focus at it. And this is making a big difference to attract foreign money to the region, number one. And number two, I think big family offices also moving down there for the regulatory reason. What Dubai, what Abu Dhabi has been done recently and the political stability in the Gulf state. Okay, so basically a lot of stability in the Middle East. Use 100%. At the moment. Okay. Denise, maybe if I may just add to that. Um, we have an annual survey, uh, being very close to our family office clients. We have a survey called the Family Barometer. Uh, and for the first time last year, um, the single biggest uh, factor for families from an investment standpoint was geographical asset diversification. And the single biggest factor for the non-investment uh, uh, aspects was uh, making sure that my wealth structure is in good shape. And some of the drivers behind that was the very conscious um, sort of knowledge of the fact that geopolitics is changing at a rapid pace mm -hmm. and what that means for these families. So it's certainly a, a very important topic for mm -hmm. families at this point. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk a bit more about, you know, competition for ultras is ultra keen, uh, ultra competitive. Um, so, and we have various hubs, you know, competing for this money, whether it's Hong Kong here, or Singapore, or Dubai, or London, or uh, the U.S. Like, where, where do you think the money is going? Like, who's winning at the moment? Um, which actually could address that. So, actually, you know, we speak about this, um, but if you go back, Financial centers have learned from each other, competed in a healthy manner for forever. Mm -hmm. Whether it was uh, asset management, whether it was uh, capital markets, whether it is listings on exchanges, whether it's hedge fund uh, assets being domiciled. So this is not new, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, every financial center will have its own value proposition, will have its strengths that it will play to, uh, and eventually it's not a binary game for families. They will choose not just one, but potentially two or three that best fit uh, the triangle of themselves and their families. And there's a lot of next generation wealth looking, uh, next generation actually looking to redomicile themselves because of education or whatever reasons. Second I think has a great role to play and we are seeing that that's the great point to access China. There is no substitute if you want to access China. All the connect schemes uh, including the wealth management connect are, are great ways to access China. So Hong Kong is playing to its strengths of a 30, 40 year uh, history. We have uh, relationship managers who have done just wealth, bank, uh, wealth management for 35 years. We have wealth planners in Hong Kong who've just done wealth planning for 30 years and that kind of deep
Uh, Pierre-Yves, we seem to have some tech problems. Uh, Pierre-Yves, I'd just like to get your opinion on in terms of yeah, where, where the money flow is going. I think in terms of offshore wealth hubs, uh, Switzerland, um, Hong Kong, and Singapore remain the three largest hubs, uh, if you look at the latest data from the Boston Consulting Group. But in terms of growth, and I think that's where it's interesting, the UAE, um, uh, as Ali was mentioning, is doing really, really well. Um, and we're seeing Singapore and Hong Kong growth uh, continue. Um, and I think Switzerland will, will remain quite stable, but quite lower in terms of grow, growth factors uh, going forward. So. I think, uh, as Rajesh was saying, uh, Hong Kong will remain a very important hub in terms of its connection with China. Um, and I think China being the biggest market in the region, it will continue to do well from, from that perspective in terms of growth going forward. Uh, the Boston Consulting Group definitely thinks that UAE, Hong Kong, and Singapore will be the three, three fastest growing hubs uh, for offshore wealth management. And I mean, the government has been making a lot of effort to bring back family offices. Do you see um, interest on that end? Definitely, I think in, in the region, family offices are mostly choosing Hong Kong um, and Singapore as their hubs. Uh, moving away from the region, they're, they're choosing mostly the UAE and Switzerland as, the, as their hubs. So okay. I definitely think that trend will continue and those four hubs will continue to strengthen. Um, Ali, what's your view on this? I think one, one, one place has been missed, it's Miami, to be honest with you. It attracts a lot of Latin America money today. If we look at Hong Kong, which is attracting all the China money, Miami did a fantastic job in the last four or five years, I think, attracting Latin America money, even as couples of people moving from New York, San Francisco to Miami. One, two, I think Hong Kong will come back. Like It's still the glamour, it's so beautiful, it is buzzing, it's you feel the wealth in the city, which is amazing, which is super nice. You enjoy it being here. I've been coming here often pre-COVID. I like the city, and I think one day we'll have an office here because you have wealth. You have more than a 1,000 billionaires in China only. You have a lots of talent here, which is very difficult to find it also anywhere in the world. Regulatory framework is, is good today, okay? I think sooner or later you'll see Hong Kong will stand back and people will come back again. So you're planning to have an office here? You Hopefully. Said? Okay. When, when do you plan to open this? The office? minute we find the talent. Sorry? <laughs> the minute we find the talent. Lots of talent in Hong Kong. Lots of talent in this room as well. I know. Um, I th and also in the family offices, what's your view? Because Hong Kong has been rolling out the red carpet. Do you see a lot more of the ultras trying to open up family offices here? I think what we see from our point of view, which is my level of learning what's happened in China and Hong Kong, is I call it 40,000 feet. Is there is a lot of money come from China domestic to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. okay? It's the language, it's understanding the lo uh, legal framework, understand the local politics is good. To attract foreign money is not going to be easy at this stage, like a Middle Eastern to open an office in Hong Kong. It why is, not? Why, why is it? I think one, it is time zone. Okay, this is one thing. Second, it is still is unknown, like everybody talking, ah, the Asia's want to invest in the Middle East, but we did not see, we see G2G, but we don't see principle to principle yet because of the lack of relationship and this market has not been developed. Plus what Switzerland has been doing, what the US has been doing, what London has been doing for the last two or three decades, attracting all these people. I think sooner or later, we will see people coming back here. Okay, and Rajesh, do you have any thoughts on the, the family office front? You know, you're based in Singapore. Uh, there's been a lot of family offices there. Do you see momentum in Hong Kong? There's tremendous momentum in Hong Kong. Um, uh, just generally, Hong Kong as, as a location for us, it's the third largest uh, location globally. Uh, we have over 500 people here, uh, and we only do private banking. So we are a focused private banking business. Um, so we have 500 people. Last year, we moved into our 100,000 square feet premises in Tutaiku Place. Um, and that's a reflection of the fact that we strongly believe in Hong Kong and it's even doing well. Um, both of our locations have had net new money uh, this year as for the last few years. Um, so they're both doing well. And the recent announcements made um, since last year uh, around the CIES, around the seven or eight factors that go into make, makes it even more interesting in addition to the DNA that I mentioned. 
So it is a very, very competitive location for family offices. You mentioned that both locations, Hong Kong and Singapore, are doing very well at the moment. Um, so like Singapore has had some issues recently in relation to money laundering. Do you see like the momentum shifting in terms of you know, where the pendulum swings? I don't think so. I mean, there, there were those incidents, but it's like cybersecurity or any of those elements. No matter how much you do, and Singapore in the Southeast Asian context has seen to be a sterling location in terms of some of those uh, measures in place to make sure it doesn't happen, and yet it can happen. So that's just a reminder uh, that we all, as a, as a financial ecosystem, need to keep working hard to learning from these experiences and, and, and keep making things better. I don't think the pendulum is swinging. Every location is dealing on its own strength. Singapore has great access to Southeast Asia. Uh, there's a big India corridor in terms of connectivity. Um, it has focused a lot on a more formal approach toward family offices, and those are its strengths. <coughs> uh, I'm sure uh, Ali will talk about Dubai, which has its huge strengths in terms of access to the Middle East and uh, also playing into the India corridor. But as I mentioned, the, the Hong Kong strengths have been 30 years of, uh, of a DNA, great capital markets, exclusive access almost to the, to, the, to the Chinese capital markets, massive amount of access to by far the largest wealth pool. So they will all play to their strengths. Okay, well, we've heard from the panelists about family offices, but I'd like to hear from the audience. So if we could go to our poll, um, if we could get that up and running. Uh, so yeah, the poll question is, what's the best location for family office? Uh, we have a, Dubai, B, Geneva, C, Hong Kong, D, New York, and E, Singapore. So uh, there's a QR code uh, for you to scan, um, yeah, in the meantime. So it would be good to find out, uh, you know, which family office location everybody is looking for. Um, while, uh, just the, for the moment, while everybody's voting at the moment, if we could look at also maybe investments and, and where people are putting their money. Um, Rajesh, I'm, I'm wondering, what, where do ultras put most of their money? So as you can imagine, you know, ultra high net worth is between 30 to 60 percent of most wealth managers' asset base. So that's a very big pool of assets, and it's not all doing the same things. Mm -hmm. I would say there are three to four major trends or themes which are playing out on different time scales. The most urgent thing is around the impact of interest rates on what investors are doing in their portfolios. So first, there was a trend uh, from sort of like current accounts to deposits. There was a massive sort of deposit war. And now that money is slowly but surely being deployed into fixed income of all sorts, from like the midterm bond equivalents all the way through structured credit in different phases. That's like the most immediate trend on investments. Then, and the, the, the flip side is what do you do with the liability side of the coin? Because your dollar loans have become very, very expensive. So people have reduced the liabilities in dollars, and there is some diversification in terms of liabilities from uh, lower interest rate currencies, perhaps the Swiss franc, perhaps yeah. uh, uh, even CNH, to kind of diversify your financing pool on the liability side. The next thing which is going on, which is much more on the longer time scale, and that's what makes me super excited, both about wealth management but also about our role, is there's a massive amount of institutionalization in the way uh, families are approaching the business of investing. The purpose behind it, a proper strategic asset allocation. Ten years back when I would ask a family, what is your IPS, your investment policy statement, I would get a lot of blank stares. And now that conversation is real. People are looking for outsourced CIO services. People are engaging with custom private markets. So a lot of the stuff that we have depth in has, has now agency, has now traction. So that's maybe at a much more kind of longer scale. And the intermediate one is U.S. primacy. There's a lot of diversification that has taken place from home bias to the U.S., led by tech, led by the general access to the market. So those would be, from my perspective, the three things that I would say. And uh, Pierre, what's your thoughts on uh, where ultras put their money? I think we just made some very good points, but to uh, add to those points, we, we do a study every year of about uh, four to 500 family offices and high net worth individuals. And from the study we did last year, uh, the two biggest trends in investing that came out were really around sustainable investing and around private assets. I think there is growing demand and growing interest in both of these areas. 
Uh, zooming into private assets, there's about two thirds of the clients that we polled who are interested to invest in private assets, but only about one third who are actually invested in them. So we think there's, there's a lot of demand that's coming for private assets and a lot of education that needs to be done around private assets and including them in their portfolios. And, and what about art? I know we sort of chatted about that earlier. Like, what about, yeah. I think uh, rare collectibles, um, alternative assets, uh, gold, uh, all these kind of asset classes remain interesting to family offices and all the family offices we speak to have those assets in their portfolios. Um, I think this trend will, will, will continue, definitely. And any particular artists that ultra you know, gravitate to? I think in the rare collectible space, clients are quite interested in watches, wine, um, art in general. Um, I think this trend will, will definitely continue. More recently, because of the geopolitical tensions, gold is also uh, um, more, in more and more discussions with clients. Mm -hmm. And Ali? I think they covered everything. <laughs> I thought you said something about cigars earlier. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was making a joke. I said one of the best performing assets we saw one of our client portfolio for the last five years was his cigar collection, to be honest with you. Okay, I think we've got the results in. Um, so, can we have that up in there? The, the, so the results of the poll, basically. Um, surprise, surprise, Hong Kong is top with 48%, and uh, next is Singapore with 28%, and Geneva with 12%, and Dubai with 8%, and New York with 4%. Clearly no home bias. No home bias. It wasn't rigged. <laughs> So, um, and, and also, I think I just wanted to check in with you, Rajesh. Earlier you talked about, um, you know, alternatives, I think, and just generally um, how the wealthy are sort of putting money into alternatives. Um, do you think there are challenges around selling, like, illiquid structures to um, ultra-wealthy individuals? So there's a lot going on in the alternative space. I think, I think you mentioned a bit, Pierre. Um, even when it comes to private markets, there's private equity, there's private credit, there's infrastructure, there's real estate, professionally managed real estate. Even when it comes to private equity, there is the way you go it alone, which is you try to be on the cap table of a company buying your own unlisted investment. You do it through funds, you co-invest, you do it through fund of funds, and so on and so forth. One very interesting dynamic I have seen is when you would talk to family offices, the sort of in-between size family offices, not the nouveau, but not the biggest, um, there was always this fascination for being on the cap table. I don't want to go through a commingle fund. I want to be on the cap table. And what this recent shakeout has illustrated, that even if you have three, four people in the family office looking at direct investments, it's not enough. Because the distribution of outcomes is so skewed, the kind of due diligence that needs to go in is so skewed. So we are seeing a return of the commingle structure back for the sort of in-between size family offices, mm -hmm. whereas the really large ones, the one with seven, eight, 10, 12 investment professionals who come from a lot of the private equity due diligence background, they continue to want to participate uh, directly in investments. Um, fundraising for private markets, illiquid has been much harder this year. There is also a fear that 60% of private markets tend to be buyouts and hence, with an increased interest rate environment, does the L in the LBO still work? Because now the cost of uh, the financing the transaction is that much higher. So it has been a tad harder, which has beautifully then been uh, supplied by these Ill the semi-liquids that the asset management industry has created, which is trying and creating quarterly liquidity or monthly liquidity from some of these illiquid strategies. So there's a massive interplay of uh, factors going on, primarily driven by the increase, uh, increased interest rates, but also the need to diversify. Um, I'd like to go into some of the lighter questions. I don't think these questions were very hard, but um, the, the first question is, what, what is the best investment you've made, um, money or otherwise? Uh, I'd like Ali to answer that question. Money-wise, the best investment, which is boot, could be rare for everybody, we invested in a business aviation called VistaJet, and we made like a decent return for our clients. We benefit out of COVID years. I think this was one of our first investments we did. Second, investing in myself and the team, where we are today. I can be proud of my team, what we invest in the time and energy. Within four years, we operate in seven countries. 
six countries, seven, New York, Miami, Geneva, Dubai, Singapore, Monaco. We've been growing more than from zero to five billion in the last four years with COVID with two wars. We're 60 professional and this will never happen without investing a lot of time and energy and working with the team in a glo globally. Okay, and uh, Pierre-Yves? I think looking with hindsight, uh, as Amy was saying earlier uh, from UBS, I think alternatives have done really well. Technology has done really well. Going forward, we're most excited about sustainable investing. I think sustainable investing and sustainability in general will be one of the biggest drivers of returns going forward. I think it's a $5 trillion a year uh, opportunity in terms of investments. Uh, and many investors and family offices are more and more interested in this area and looking for science-based approach on how to invest in that space. Okay. And what about uh, Patek Philippe watches? What's your view on that? D definitely. I think rare collectibles in the alternative space will remain uh, an attractive a niche. It's a very niche asset class, mm. but I think it will remain attractive for, for clients, definitely. Right. Uh, Rajesh? Personally or...? Um... Yeah, personally, yes. Well, I started my educational career being an electrical engineer. And okay. here I am on the stage with you talking about ultra high net worth clients. Uh, so I, I am with the consensus uh, panelists before uh, us uh, that investing in myself has been, frankly, the biggest uh, personal success of, of investments. When I was doing my engineering, I realized I should become, uh, I, I got interested in business. When I was doing business, I got interested in investments. When I did investments, I got interested in alternative investments. So that for me personally, uh, but in terms of financial uh, investments, uh, two things in terms of just uh, percentage, it was my small Bitcoin holdings in my MetaMask wallet that played out well, but it didn't make me rich. The thing that actually so helped you're gonna me- you going to retire soon. No, actually it's very small. It was just an experimental purchase, an impulse purchase. But the thing, when I moved to Singapore from India, and this was the year 2004, I started putting money in what was then a recently launched iShares ETF called the SNP Core ETF. And that became like my retirement account. Whenever I had some spare cash, I put that. My original investment is now 5X. So in terms of risk adjusted returns, that's been the, the most fantastic. Wow, so sometimes the simple things work. Okay. And uh, the next question is, um, you know, Ali, what's your advice for young people on how to build wealth? I think focus, discipline, allocate your time for what you like and what you love. That's it. That's it's very simple. Discipline, discipline, discipline. Focus, focus, focus. And allocate your time for something you love. Okay. And Pierre Yves? I think adding to what Ali just said, the time, I think, is probably one of the most important factors. What do I mean by time? Compounding, right? So I think the young generations need to start investing as early as possible not wait for them to be in their 40s or in their 50s, but really start investing in their 20s. Diversification, compounding, and time are your best friends. That's true. That's something they never teach you at school. Definitely. I have two teenage daughters, and I tell them what I, what I said before. It's human capital before financial capital. So once you have the human capital, then, uh, then you have to worry about the financial capital. The other thing, uh, they're, st they're still too young for this, but I strongly believe that markets are generally fairly priced 80 to 90% of the times. So the 10 to 20% of the times you're taking a contrarian view, you better know why you're taking that contrarian view and you better back it up and only then it'll pay out. And then the rest I agree with, uh, with Pierre-Yves about, uh, about compounding diversification, etc. A lot of people talk about this. It's really hard to practice. It's like waking up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym, like, like Bonnie mentioned, it's hard. You get easily seduced by different things. You believe you know better than the market, and that usually doesn't happen. So it's, it's important to test your assumptions and, and question everything. Okay, I think we'll take a, maybe a question from the audience. Um, one question is, what is the panel's view uh, on family office appetite for crypto-type assets, um, you know, and, and the change from traditional assets? Okay. We always tell our clients, if you invest, if you invest in art, wine, uh, all this collectible uh, watches, jewelries, as an asset class, you should put two, one, two percent in a crypto. If you never done these type of assets, okay, and it was not part of your asset, of, of part of your portfolio, you should not touch at this because too volatile. It's a long term. It is you allocate one, two percent to the whole portfolio. It's not going to change your life. Okay. 
I think similar to what Ali was saying, I think uh, many of our clients are interested in that space. We are not involved in that space directly, but we do see clients uh, invest a small part of their assets in that space. We have, uh, as Julius Baer, been quite involved in the space uh, because we know that clients will do it one way or the other. So we felt that it's important to get engaged. So for the last four years or so, we've been tracking the space. We have been writing research reports for the last two, three years. It's very hard with that volatility to have a view uh, on target prices and things like that. But we have been engaged in the space. We also have an investment in SEBA, which is uh, uh, the first of two crypto banks in the world. Um, so we've been engaged in the space. What we see happening is originally the hype was driven more by speculation and a little bit trying to make a quick buck, or for these extremely negative views about the collapse of the financial system and how this is all, a, you know, the traditional financial system is just all a big scam. So that has been replaced by a lot more institutional grade sort of uh, research into the topic. And when we talk to our families' uh, offices uh, these days, there is a big risk that the way the U.S. dollar was used almost as a, you know, like the financialization of the financial, the, the, the weaponization of the financial system uh, with sanctions and things like that, from the perspective of family offices, is one reason whether it's physical gold or whether it's the digital version of that, which is Bitcoin in particular. I'm not talking about the other current uh, uh, digital car uh, virtual assets, but specifically Bitcoin, which has somewhat similar analogous characteristics. Uh, are becoming more and more, maybe two, three, five percent uh, kind of allocations of family mm. offices. Okay. So um, I think we need to wrap up quite soon. We do have one question. Maybe Ali can take. What's the impact of MENA stabili stability um, of the recent regional conflict and the recent financial challenges in Saudi Arabia? I'll start quickly with Saudi Arabia, then go to the conflict. I said Saudi Arabia, we see in the media they went to borrow a lot, but it's a country still dead to GDP is one of the lowest in the G20. The country did not invest in infrastructure for the last 50, 70 years. The development recently led by His Excellency MBS to develop the country, to try to be one of the top 10 cities in the world, need this massive investment. He can do it. They've been doing it and compare them, which is mark to market, dead to GDP, still they are the lowest with the G20. I think there's a lot to form about the way they're spending, the new project, but people was laughing at Dubai 20 years ago when they did the palms. The most expensive real estate has been sold in the Middle East was in the palms. This is fact. And on the, the other question, at the stability in the Middle East, I think you have to split the Middle East to two. You have the Gulf state, which is Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and the rest of the Middle East, which is Iran, the Levant, Syria, Jordan, uh, Palestine, and all the way to Israel and up to Turkey. The GCC stake has been holding the stick from the middle, not taking side. They try to do their best between Qataris and Saudi Arabia, even the UAE, and the conflict on the ground. I think there is a big effort, but it cannot be done by only the Middle Eastern side. Our European colleagues have to move. Our American colleagues have to move to make it a lot more stable. Okay, I think that wraps up our panel. Thank you very much.